Hello and welcome to another edition of Ask JBN Tech. This is where we answer your questions. You've submitted using the hashtag Ask JBN Tech. Uh, and you should comments. Uh, you can send them in the post, but we probably won't read them. <laughs> Social media, maybe. Uh, yeah, so on digital platforms. Uh, and I believe you've got the first question. Oh, I do, yes. Okay, so M. Miller says he's recently built up a Trek Supercaliber with full XTR drivetrain and brakes. His issue is with the drivetrain, though, because all of his gears uh, have a vibration through the drivetrain under load. It feels like there are bearings grinding. Um, he does go on to say that he's checked the BB and the jockey wheels and everything and it all seems to be running smooth. So what's the issue? Um, I, this is a really common issue um, I, that you might want to check when you built it up. Did you thread the chain through the derailleur correctly? Because there's this tiny little bridge um, on the sort of lower arm of the derailleur that your chain needs to be on the correct side of because if it's not, it will rub against that um, and it would literally just be like a da 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 the whole time, every time your chain moves. So check that first. Um, it could also be something somewhere else that's not necessarily your drivetrain, but you said that it's under load. So maybe it could be even your pedal bearings. Um, I've definitely felt grinding and knocking sounds just because of loose pedals effectively. Um, so do check those out as well, because I don't know if you change them. Um, but going back to the drivetrain as well, have you set up the B tension correctly? Because if there's not enough B tension, then the chain could effectively just sort of sit on itself uh, and rub against the, the derailleur. So um, that will also create a grinding sound, even though everything seems to be moving perfectly well. So do check those things out. The next question is from Mary Candles, who says, will we ever see ABS on normal MTBs? Uh, maybe. Uh, ABS. Uh, <laughs> Should we just leave it there? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, ABS, anti-lock braking systems, right? It's what we've got in cars, motor vehicles, um, motorbikes, and increasingly cargo bikes, e-touring bikes, and e-mountain bikes. Um, the Bosch have developed this system that work with the Gura and Tektro, and Tektro's high-end TRP brakes. Um, they use sensors to pulse the brakes on and off when you're braking really hard and attempt to stop you skidding, particularly on road surfaces uh, and on the e-mountain bikes, on mountain bike surfaces. Hmm. Um, it could say this obviously needs power, so on an e-mountain bike or an e-cargo bike, that battery is already there. Um, so on a regular mountain bike, that would need to be something built into it. Um, mm. And all of that system adds a little bit more mass to the bike. So on an e-mountain bike, it's maybe a smaller portion than we'd see on a regular mountain bike. Um, so maybe we'll see them coming across if they do slim down and get lighter. Um, yeah, there's pros and cons, isn't there? Because I guess it, yeah. it is going to give you more control, but it might take away from the purity of the experience. Or your riding style, you might want to initiate skids in corners. And you've mm. got to think that EMTBs are quite different beasts to mountain bikes. So do we need it uh, when our bikes aren't as heavy is another question. So I guess the short answer yeah. is yes, probably, but probably not everyone will have it. Because <laughs> people would have said the same thing about disc brakes, right, yeah. 20 years ago when maybe they were yeah. in their infancy of the technology. And we couldn't, and we say, oh, we don't need those. Cantilever brakes are absolutely fine. <laughs> and now we, we don't think that's the case. They were never fine. Because they're, because disc brakes have developed so much. So, yeah, there's a few things to iron out, but don't shoot me if they never appear, because I think they probably will. Okay, my next question from Bill Duras, who says, uh, my specialized Levo came with mixed wheel setup, 27.5 in the rear. If I change the rear wheel to 29 inch, should I also change the chain ring from a 32 to a 30 tooth? Uh, to keep the overall gearing about the same? Um, good question, and not many people think about this because that rear wheel is effectively another cog in the drivetrain. So if you increase the wheel, um, then you increase the distance, well, the circumference has now increased, so you cover the distance that you cover with that wheel uh, also increases. So it will feel harder with every one pedal revolution, you're covering more distance, so it does feel harder. Mm. Um, um, so by coming down from a 32 to a 30, you're effectively countering that difference and it should feel on par with your 27.5. However, if you're going to change it anyway, why not try it out with the existing 32 tooth? You're going to get a new feel with this uh, bigger wheel. You're going to be rolling over stuff, carrying more momentum. You mm -hmm. might actually 
want a bigger gear to uh, start pedaling with that momentum rather than with the 27.5. I certainly feel like I'm accelerating a lot more with a 27.5, so I do like a lower gear with that anyway. Um, so long answer short, try it out. <laughs> yeah. And if you don't like it, you can always drop to a 30 afterwards. Our next question is from Fee, F-E, uh, and their forks travels completely sucked up since they added a token. Uh, they've tried to add their regular pressure, but all I can get is around 50% of the full travel. Uh, when I add 20 to 30 PSI more, so quite a lot, um, I get the full travel, but when I remove the 20 PSI again, I lose it. Uh, and they always cycle the suspension while increasing or decreasing the pressure. I'm not sure what to do. I think the first thing to do, because Really, the token shouldn't affect the suck down. It's a slightly different thing. Is remove the token, return it to your old pressures, and see if you're still getting any suck down. Because um, why that tends to happen, if you're being good and you're cycling your suspension, trying to even up the pressure between the positive and negative air chambers, um, is that there's something, uh, a lubricating oil or grease in the fork that's blocking that dimple that allows the transfer of air. Um, and if, if you feel confident in yourself, you can watch our video on how to clean it out and equalize your forks, um, or you can take it to a service center and get that cleaned up. Um, because the you do have to adjust your pressure a bit if you change the tokens, you change the volume, and Boyle's Law, you have to bump the pressure up to get the same amount of sag. You can't just return to your old pressure settings, but it's it wouldn't be 20 to 30 <coughs> PSI, it'd just no. be a couple of PSI. Yeah. So really, it shouldn't be affected by adding or removing tokens. I would take your forks apart to check there's no grease in the wrong place, there's nothing going on, or get them serviced, which is never a bad thing anyway, um, and really look into that rather than worrying about the tokens themselves. Okay, my next question is from James, like Cher, I guess. Uh, he said, I have a DT Swiss hub with GX Eagle cassette and I am looking to put a Shimano LG700 Link Glide cassette on instead. Um, I'm in need of a HG Ratchet Free Hub to replace my XD Ratchet, um, but it's been quite hard to find, uh, he goes on to say. Uh, can I use a DT Swiss 11 speed Road Free Hub? Um, and use the, uh, or do I need a mountain bike specific one? Um, technically, yes, you can use a road free hub body, uh, but they do tend to be a little bit longer than mountain bike ones. So it, you would actually, if you're putting a mountain bike cassette on that road free hub body, then you'll need to use a 1.85 mil spacer to make up the difference. So Yes, that works. Uh, however, I do question the fact that you potentially are moving from a SRAM drivetrain to a Shimano Link Glide cassette. Now, Link Glide is quite specific, aims at EMTB. It's got a sort of a different mechanism that, um, that picks up the chain uh, that's aimed at mountain bikers. And that reason, it's quite um, unique in that it needs to be working with its own components and chains and chain rings. So if you're not changing all of your drivetrain to Link Glide, I would question whether you really want that cassette. Um, however, if you do go for for a Shimano cassette of something else, um, then you can find some alternate free, well, we found some alternative uh, free hub bodies that fit DT Swiss. Um, so you might just wanna do a little bit of extra research and also consider eBay or contacting friends that you know who have uh, DT Swiss wheels because a lot of people are actually moving from Hyperglide to Microspline or to XD. So you might even be able to initiate a swap there. A final question for today is from Armand Rivera, and they say, what makes an MTB a good climber, John Munchy, suspension setup, etc., is a good climber automatically a bad descender? Um, not, I think within specific genres of mountain bike, no. You know, like a, a well set up bike is gonna maybe climb and descend better than a poorly set up bike. It's really when you get to the extreme end of the kind of travel and geometry, like a downhill bike is built for one purpose, and that's not climbing, um, where there's a good climbing XC bike compared to other XC bikes, that doesn't mean that it will automatically be a bad descending XC bike compared to other XC bikes. If you sort of narrow it down, good bikes, good bikes, bad bikes, bad bikes. Um, but the good climbing geometry specifically, we tend to think about uh, a steeper seat angle, get you over that bottom bracket and sort of not falling behind the bike, um, a slightly lower front end, uh, maybe not a super low bottom bracket because you want that pedal clearance and and then maybe a slightly longer reach. Um, and good climbing suspension, you want to be supportive under power, not have lots of pedal bob. Um, so maybe a damp mid-stroke as well. You want good small bump grip. 
um, so you're not spinning it out. And those, the thing is, those are good all-round attributes anyway, and it kind of leads into this thing. That usually what we see with bikes that climb really well um, are also really good at descending. And uh, the only real thing is with lockouts, you add a lot of high-speed compression. It's like the strongest form of compression damping. It doesn't get blown off. And that gives you that really supportive stroke that then will be a little bit too harsh and maybe not the best at descending. But apart from that, it's just good bikes are good bikes. Yeah, so I guess the short answer is you can have great climbing bikes that are terrible descenders, but you can also have great descending bikes that are brilliant climbers. I've definitely mm. got an enduro bike at the moment that is so good at climbing because of that seat angle and whatnot. But anyway, uh, that's all we've got time for today. Um, if you've got any burning questions after hearing all of this, then do leave hashtag AskGMBNTech with your question down in the comments below so we can find it and answer it on a show like this. Uh, but thank you for watching for now, and we'll see you soon.